field in computer control physics, um, and I guess I'm going to try and tie into. Is the mic too loud, or no, it's fine. Uh, it sounds really loud to me, and I've had experiences with the mic being turned up a little too high in the past. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So what I want to talk about is uh, is a mixture of things, and based on the talks that I've heard in the first part of this week. I was thinking of putting it to a vote what the second lecture will be, and we'll see at the end of this lecture whether that makes sense or whether I'm doing something really stupid. Um, so what I'm sort of planning on talking about in the first lecture is sort of the idea of where does multi-photon coupling come from? So can we calculate or can we sort of do a simple calculation that gives us an idea of where that comes in the first place? Because you've heard a lot of really nice talks on how you can use strong fields to um, ionize atoms and molecules, and how you can use those strong fields to generate harmonics, and how those harmonics then give you this very short time resolution. But where does the where does the multiphoton coupling between bound states or between bound and continuum states come from in the first place? And what I'm going to try and do is motivate that with a small derivation to sort of give you the picture of where that coupling comes from and how you can do the calculation yourself, and then show a few examples of experiments. Um, where people have made use of that, and also seen what the consequences of it are. Because along with that, that strong field coupling comes, of course, light shifts, which are strong field light shifts, or dynamic start shifts. And those two are not independently controllable. Once you have multi-photon coupling, you always have dynamic start shifts. And those can be useful or a hindrance, depending on what you're interested in doing. So, um, so the first talk... The first lecture I was going to talk about um, uh, strong field excitation and dynamic start shifts. And I'd originally, whoops, um, I have to get the, you know, this thing a little better. I was going to talk about in the section lecture, second lecture, strong field uh, molecular ionization. And the idea of, okay, well, you have lots of electrons. Which one are you actually taking out when you do strong field ionization? But since that topic has been covered, or certainly um, topics very close to that have been covered, I'm considering switching over the second lecture to focus on quantum holography, um, and we can maybe have a vote, but everybody has to agree to vote at the end um, on whether that will happen. So, <clears throat> I think you guys have already heard about um, a two-level atom um, and how the light shifts come about, but I just thought I would go to one more time, or go over it again in a slightly different framework so that I set up some notation, and, um, and then we'll see how this becomes interesting um, when you have more than two levels and uh, what happens with those two levels are not dipole coupled, etc. So if we start off um, with a two-level atom and, and an AC off resonant field, so there's some detuning delta, and we have a photon energy, h bar omega, and the energies of our states are E1 and E2, then in the dipole approximation, our, uh, our Hamiltonian looks like this, and we have energies in the diagonals, and the off-diagonals we have the coupling terms. And um, if we transform this Hamiltonian, um, then uh, we can transform it with this operator here. And basically, we're just having some uh, time-dependent phases we're putting in here. And when we transform the Hamiltonian, we get this Hamiltonian here, which just now has the diagonals, the detuning. And again, we have our um, coupling terms on the off-diagonals. Um, one more transformation um, to go to another interaction picture. And um, when we do that, we get a new Hamiltonian, um, which is formed by sort of an adiabatic term. And then we have this additional term here. And if we have a slowly varying field, which is doing the coupling, so um, just going back to the earlier slide, we have a field that's doing the coupling, which has an envelope function here. This is a time-dependent envelope function. And this is just basically oscillating at the um, carrier frequency of that field then if that envelope is slowly varying, then we have this adiabatic part here, which has the adiabatic energies of the dress states, which you've heard about many times already. And you have this non-adiabatic term here, which we have to take into account if we have a rapidly varying envelope function for a field, which is doing the coupling. So I'm considering um, a, a laser field, which is coupling these two states, which has an envelope function which can be slowly or rapidly varying. And this is just taking the situation where we have it slowly varying enough that I can ignore this term here, okay, um, and, uh, and only concentrate on the adiabatic term here. And when I do that, I get that my adiabatic eigenenergies are simply given by the square root of the 
the tuning squared and probably frequency squared, and this is the familiar formula. And if we expand this um, in a Taylor series, just making the, uh, the approximation that we have a large detuning compared to our Robbie frequency, then you can see we get this expansion, and neglecting the detuning term, we have our light shift, which just simply goes like the Robbie frequency squared um, uh, multiplied by h-bar divided by um, the detuning and by four. So, um, that's sort of the simple two-level case. Note that the sign of the shift depends on the detuning. This is something you've seen before. Um, and uh, um, now we're going to go and say, well, um, what happens um, if we're now interested in considering a multi-photon coupling case? So now let's sort of think about this as sort of the basis, or the basic idea behind a lot of strong field experiments. That you're interested in coupling two states, let's say some ground state, and some other state which could be bound or in the continuum. And those two states um, are, let's say, not either, either not dipole, dipole coupled or the field that you have is not able to um, resonantly couple them. And so let's imagine that we can have some absorption of a, of a number of photons that's greater than one to go from our initial state to our final state. How can we describe that absorption and um, what consequences does it have? And this is something that, for instance, when I was a student, um, I didn't know how to calculate a multi-photon transition probability, and uh, it came about in a lot of the experiments that I was working on. For instance, I was working on an experiment in Phil's lab on where we had to excite an atom from the 6s ground state to the 7s excited state, and we did it with a, uh, a, a Raman shifted dye laser, and when I wanted to sit down and calculate the probability of going from the ground state to the excited state, I never knew how to do it. And so I always thought, okay, maybe this is a nice little um, explanation, which also carries with it the um, a lesson in how multi-photon coupling comes from all of the off-resonant states, which you're gonna, I'm going to show you how to adiabatically eliminate in the first place. But the point that I want to make is that if you only have two states, and let's imagine that these are, let's say, states where they're of an atom, like let's say a sodium or a lithium atom, and they're both S states, so that, let's say in lithium, the 2S ground state and the 3S excited state, we want to make a transition between these states. If there were no other states of the atom, there would be no possibility to couple these two states. All of the coupling is mediated through all of the other non-resonant states that exist in the system. And um, people have sometimes parameterized that in terms of a virtual state. And I sort of, when I first heard this, sort of nodded along, but never really understood what this virtual state meant or where it comes from, and how it has anything to do with the two-photon probability. And really, it's basically a sort of a crutch or a way of sort of just imagining that there was a resonant state here, and you can go through it to this final excited state. Um, but what I want to show you is that it's really the coupling that's driven by all of these other dipole coupled states that allows you to make this, let's say, two-photon absorption transition. Um, and so now I'm going to go to a PDF file, where, um, because I have this derivation all over the tech. So, can people, I can blow it up until people can see the, all of the font. Either that, or you guys can move if you're on this. Thank you. Um, it's fine. It's just fine? Um, should I turn off the front lights? Uh, yeah. Is that this one? Okay. Is that, can people read that? Even I can read it, can read it so. Okay, and these will all be available, so. I am a particular, like whenever I give lectures in a class, I always like to write on a blackboard because it keeps me honest and so mine is signs don't just get swept under the rug. Um, so I'm going to try and go at a, at a rate here that is sufficient that you can follow it, but if you're interested in the derivation at all, it'll always be available online and I can give you to you as a, as a tech PDF file. Plus, um, I, I guess all the lectures will be made available afterwards. So, so let's imagine that we have um, the following system. So I'm doing just a two-photon absorption situation because it's the sort of the easiest case and everything else follows as a sort of natural but tedious extension of this. And so it's just a really simple idea. I have two states, let's say a ground state and an excited state, and I can reach them via multi-photon absorption. And let's say that's two, absorption of two photons from some laser that has frequency of magnetic. And, of course, there's an infinite number of bound states in an atomic system. 
And, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up my system into the two states that I'm interested in, the ground state and the excited state, which I'm going to assume I have a laser where two photons is energetically uh, exactly the right um, amount of energy to take me from the ground state to the excited state. And then there's a whole bunch of other states in the system which are either dipole coupled to these grounded and excited states or not. And the ones that are not dipole coupled I'm going to completely ignore. And all the other states which are dipole coupled I'm going to put here in a separate vertical column here. And these are all labeled with M as an index which can sum from, let's say, 1 to infinity. And these are all the off-resonant dipole coupled states, which are going to give rise to the transition probability from this state to this state, even though we actually never put any significant population in any of these off-resonant states. So the idea is that we're going to take the Schrodinger equation for the atom with this infinite number of states, and we're going to truncate that sum of states to a finite number, and we're going to try and eliminate the ones that we're not interested in, in order to get a very simple two-level atomic Hamiltonian for the ground to excited state coupling, which has taken all of these other states out and just put it into some sum, which I can calculate independently of this, and it's going to give us a very simple formalism for how to think about multi-photon coupling between two levels. That's the idea. Um, and, and please, I prefer interruptions. Um, to questions at the end, um, but so if there's anything that is not clear, or if you find a minus sign. So, just if these are all one photon non-resonant couplings. That's right. Said. So I'm just, uh, you know, here's your photon energy, and here are the states. They're all off-resonant, as you can see. I mean, it's going to generally be the case. But that and manifold then is just only one. Yeah, this is like, for, so if, if we consider an atom, let's, let's consider a, a specific case, because sometimes it makes it easier. So let's, th we did this with, originally when we, when we had been thinking about this, we were doing this for sodium. So let's take atomic sodium, and the nice thing is that all of the numbers that you need for a calculation this, like this are on the NIST Atomic Physics Database. So you can just go and you can look up all the dipole couplings, and it's all there. And then you can plug it into a spreadsheet, which I'll show you at the end, which basically just allows you to um, get all of the coupling terms um, from previous measurements. But if you do this for a molecule, you can use ab initial electronic structure, or if you do this for some other atom, then you can calculate what the dipole companies are. But, so let's say sodium, the ground state is the 3S state, okay? And um, I'm going to be ignoring um, basic hyperfine structure for the purpose of this discussion. So we start off, let's say, in the 3S ground state, and we're interested in going to the 4S state. Then these are all the L equals 1 states, all the P states, and then there's, of course, all kinds of D and so on, which I'm going to be ignoring because they're not dipole coupled to these guys. You can do an explicit calculation where you just make a huge matrix and put all of the states into the calculation and then solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation to show that the population in these states is very, very low and therefore any population in further dipole coupled, you know, states that are basically L equals to 2 or higher is going to be even lower. And so this approximation is actually pretty good. So, so what does our Schrodinger equation look like? Well, it looks basically like this. So if we have our wave function, oh sorry, this is not yet the Schrodinger equation, this is just our wave function. So if we start off with our wave function, I can make an expansion based on the eigenstates of the atomic Hamiltonian. So these are the field-free, so I here represents the field-free eigenstates of the atomic Hamiltonian. This could be also for a molecule. And there are time-dependent coefficients. So A sub I's here are just complex numbers um, between 0 and 1 in magnitude. And um, these states each evolve um, with a, um, a phase that's given by the, the omega sub i is, of course, the energy of that state divided by h bar. So if we insert this wave function into the time dependent Schrodinger equation, um, then um, it just simply looks like this. Um, and uh, so the time dependent is now given by the atomic field uh, atom field interaction, and um, uh, I've separated out the states here into the ground state and the excited state, and all the other dipole coupled states um, where we're summing over. So this is basically the, the Schrodinger equation becomes an equation for the evolution of the time dependent coefficients for each of the eigenstates. So I'm just using the eigenstates as a basis for the Schrodinger equation, 
and solve it for the time dependence. So, if we can assume that, um, that the non-resonant states are not significantly populated, then we can try and adiabatically eliminate them from the interaction. And the basic criterion for doing that is that the detuning between any of those states and the two states that I'm interested in is large compared to the Rabi frequency. And what that's saying is that the interpretation of that is that basically any population that gets transferred up there is quickly transferred back down to the ground state because the, um, the, the phase evolution between those two is going at the detuning and that's cycling so quickly that you go from stimulated absorption to stimulated emission every half cycle of that detuning period. And so that any population you put up there gets quickly transferred back down or onto the further to the excited state. So that's how we can eliminate all of these off-resonant states because their detuning is large compared to, of course, the Rabi frequency for each of those states. So, so we have now just breaking out that Schrodinger equation into three equations. Um, we have an equation for the ground state, for the excited state, and for all of the intermediate states. And um, you can see that the ground and excited state equations are expressed in terms of these intermediate states, but that's what we want to get rid of. Because we want to derive, essentially, a two-level atomic Hamiltonian, which has only got this guy and this guy in there. And we can do that by formally integrating the differential equation for this guy using the integration by parts. So this is basically just saying, these are somewhat notes to myself that I left in here, but it's saying a lot of what I'm telling you by words. So <clears throat> if we make use of the atom field interaction Hamiltonian, as basically in the dipole approximation, it's just the dipole operator multiplied by the electric field divided by h bar. And if we express our electric field as an envelope, and as a function of time, it's a complex valued envelope. So this can have an amplitude and a phase. Um, and then we have a carrier frequency, and then, of course, to make it real, we have a complex conjugate. Then, um, if I substitute these guys in to the equation that I had earlier for the off-resonant states, then I get this equation right here. And basically, this is just an integral, which I can now do by parts, making some um, simple approximation. So, the basic approximation that we're going to make is essentially um, equivalent to a slowly varying envelope approximation. So what I'm going to assume is that the derivative or the change in my electric field is going to be slower than the detuning that I have between any of the um, non-resonant states and the initial or final states that I'm going to or from. So <coughs> if I make that approximation, then I get an equation. I can basically just do integration of parts. If we have the integral of v du, then I can express that as the integral of as this basically uv minus the u dv. And so I'm going to identify terms in this integral up here that are going to be fast oscillating terms and terms in this integral that are going to be oscillating slowly. So you see that I'm going to have terms that are basically the difference in energy between the ground state and the intermediate states and the excited state, or sorry, excited state and intermediates, and grad and intermediate states. And that's going to be multiplied by my field oscillations, and so I'm going to get differences in sums of those frequencies. Those are going to be rapidly oscillating <coughs> compared to the field envelope here, and of course the probabilities of being in these, the probability amplitudes for being in these states are also going to follow my field envelope, so those are going to be the slowly varying terms, which I'm going to make use of in my integration by parts. So, basically when I do that integration by parts, um, I'm going to draw off the second, I'm going to basically make my, um, just keep this term here and drop this second integral, which is going to be very small compared to this first part making this approximation. And so, this is basically it. It's, it's in some senses to me, so simple, and yet it's at something that um, I think is a nice general result. So that allows me to now have a formal equation for how these guys evolve as a function of time. And I can take this solution here, which I just did by integration of parts, making this approximation. 
and plug it into the differential equations that I have for the excited and the ground state amplitudes. And so that's what I'm doing right here. I'm just taking this term here and plug it in, plug it into the equation that I have here for the excited and ground states. And you can see that I basically just need to insert this solution that I got from integration. And so then I get an expression for the ground state and the excited states, which no longer involve the intermediate states. All they involve is now, again, just the, the Hamiltonian term for the coupling between them. Yeah? Great. This might be a dumb question, but um, do we drop the rapidly rotating states just because their effect averages out over the course? So you mean all of the, uh, all of the states which I've low, uh, sub with a subscript M? Yeah, all of the off resonance states? We're dropping those out because basically, if you um, think about the right way to describe this, but it was what I tried to allude to earlier that if you consider transferring population from the ground state up to some intermediate state, then the phase between the laser light and the atomic um, states, so the phase between the two atomic states will evolve at their, at their energy difference. And the phase of the light field will evolve at laser frequency. And therefore, the phase of the laser and the phase between these two states will evolve at a very different rate if you're off resonance. And since it's evolving at a very different rate, then they will quickly going from zero phase to pi phase difference, right, between the, the laser field and the, the, the coherence in the atom. And that means you go from stimulated absorption to stimulated emission. So it means that the atom stops absorbing and it puts the population right back down into the ground state very quickly. So you cycle between stimulated, stimulated absorption and stimulated emission very quickly. And that's how you can adiabatically eliminate those states because you can say, so basically say that the population that's in those states is such, it's up there for such a short time that it's essentially zero. You don't have time to drive a significant amount up there. If I, if I may, uh, this may not have been quite the question. The question was, tell me if I'm wrong, but whether you were dropping the non-rotating wave terms. Oh, terms. is that, the, you mean the counter-rotating counter terms? Is that your question? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I can also address that question. And so the, 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 the question is basically what, what Pierre was addressing is basically that I'm going to have um, in the integral, I'm going to have terms, well actually it comes out of, I can show them right here. You're going to have terms that go like omega sub g plus omega sub o and omega sub e plus omega sub omega, sub omega naught. And um, some of these are going to rotate much faster than others. And the terms that go like Essentially, if these are similar in magnitude, the difference between the ground state and the excited state and the, and the laser frequency, then those are going to rotate much faster, and of course that's going to lead to a much faster phase evolution. And those counter-rotating terms I can also draw. So, so now if I um, replace, so where was I? I was, I was at the point where um, we had just substituted in our um, expression for a sub m, and we still have this term here, um, the, basically the dipole operator sandwiched in between the ground and the intermediate states, and I can substitute that in, and I get this big ugly expression here, which I can simplify to some extent um, by defining um, a two-photon tuning, and that's basically just the difference between the excited and the ground states subtracting off two photons. And so that gives me a, basically a, a, a two-photon detuning. Re-expressing a lot of these terms here, in terms of that two-photon two, two detuning, um, I get a slightly cleaner expression for the ground and the excited states. And um, we can now go back to this point that Pierre was addressing, which is the so-called two-photon rotating wave approximation. So the rotating wave approximation, again, was to always consider you're going to have terms that are evolving with a phase that goes roughly at the difference between the laser frequency and, um, and, the, and, the, and the energy difference between the two states. And you're going to have terms that are evolving with a phase that goes at their sum. And of course, that sum is going to mean very rapid phase evolution. And I can drop those terms in the integral because when I integrate a multiplication of a slow oscillating term times a rapidly oscillating term, that's essentially integrated out to zero. Um, 
So, um, so we're going to basically keep terms that oscillate rather slowly, and all of these terms that have very rapid phase evolution, we're going to drop. And the nice thing about making approximations like this is you can simply plug this into a computer, integrate the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and seeing if you're making a significant error or not. Um, so then we get a little bit simpler expressions right here. So this is the okay, still working. This is the um, ground state probability amplitude and the excited state probability amplitude, and you can see that. There are both diagonal terms, if I'm going to write this in Hamiltonian form, terms that go at the ground, that are proportional to the ground state probability amplitude in the derivative here, and terms that are proportional to the excited state. And so what that's telling you right away is you're going to get terms that are basically like an energy shift, because diagonal terms in the Hamiltonian are like energy shifts, and off-diagonal terms are like couplings. So, we can now define what I will call dynamic Stark shift terms. Let me just see if I can fit both of that in there. Not quite. Okay. I can define what I call a dynamic Stark shift here of the ground and the excited state. Now, these are the, essentially the light shifts when you have multi-photon coupling. That is, we looked at the light shifts for you know, a, a single photon coupling between two dipole allowed states. And now we're considering, well, what is, how do the light shifts go if you're making a multi-photon transition. And the answer is right here now. Now we see that we have basically a sum over all the off-resonant states, and everything is proportional to the light intensity squared. We have product of ground state um, or excited state uh, to intermediate state uh, transition dipole moments. And um, we can write this as basically a term, which is just a number here, multiplied by the laser intensity. And this number here, I can show you a spreadsheet of how to evaluate that number. You can calculate it. And we also have a multi-photon coupling, which is given by this simple expression here. And that's, again, just a number multiplied by the intensity of the laser pulse squared. Of course, there's a phase here because we've assumed for a complex envelope, and that phase makes it slightly different dependence on the laser field. But essentially, both of these depend on the intensity the same way. Um, and um, there's a few points that I wanted to make. So one is that both the intensity, both the, both the coupling and the start shifts follow the intensity of the laser in the same way. That is, they both follow the intensity of the laser. So we can factor that out of the equation. And what that means is that if there's going to be strong coupling between these states, there's also going to be a strong start shift. And we can't use the laser intensity to play with the ratio of those two. So that's one thing that makes, for instance, the, 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 the situation a little bit more interesting or different from the single photon case. Because in the single photon case, um, you can adjust the intensity of the laser and uh, separately control the light shifts with your independent control of the detuning. Here, they're basically, once you've hit the two photon resonance, you have no further control over the ratio of the dynamic start shift and the coupling. Um, and what I think is also kind of nice is that there's a basic intuition which can work in determining how the start shift and the coupling works based on the two-level approximation that we looked at earlier. That is, if I go and I consider, there's, if I look at the start shift term here, there's a difference between the frequency between the, the intermediate states and the laser frequency, and of course that sign gets imprinted on the star shift. So if we're looking at an off-resonant state, which is slightly below um, the photon energy, then it's always going to push that state down in the star shift. And if it's slightly above, if, this, if, the, if the photon energy is, the difference in state energies is like this, and so my photon is, is, is red detuned, then it's going to push the star shift up. And so you're going to get contributions from all of these off-resonant states that are some are going to be up and some are going to be down, and you just have to go through that sum and see which ones are up and down. So finally, we arrive at a Hamiltonian if we make those definitions for the star shifts and for the multi-photon coupling, which is particularly simple and straightforward. It's a 2 by 2 Hamiltonian. On the diagonals, we have the dynamic star shifts. 
of the um, ground and excited state, and on the off diagonals we have the multi-photon coupling. And we can transform this Hamiltonian yet again, just by making a simple transformation, another unitary transformation, which just changes the phase of the states. Um, and by making that sim simple transformation, we get another, which I think is intuitive form of this Hamiltonian. And now we have, simply on the off-diagonal elements, we have a multi-photon Rabi frequency. And on the diagonal terms here, we have a differential dynamic starship. That's just the difference between the ground state and the excited state dynamic starships. We have a detuning here. And we have the derivative of the laser phase. So what I would call this is basically the atom laser phase here. And this is now just different from the single photon case in the, in the terms of that it evolves with the, with the, the phase of the atom the, relative to the laser evolves with a term that's proportional to the intensity of the laser pulse. And it also can depend on the phase of the laser field. If I have a time-dependent phase in my laser field, I can try and compensate for that phase advance of the dynamic start shift in order to make an effective multi-photon coupling in the atom. So, um, and that also sort of hints at the multi-photon version of a pi pulse, because you can simply think about it that, okay, I can also transform that phase into being in the off-diagonal elements, and then, if you say, well, I'm interested in basically making the integral of this guy here to be pi over 2 for a pi pulse, then um, that gives you the pi pulse condition here, um, which um, is a guess for how you'd want to program on some time-dependent phase and what kind of intensity you'd need to pick. So you'd need to choose alpha so that basically alpha doesn't vary very much during the time that the pulse is on so that this integral can go up to pi over 2. If alpha varies while the pulse is on, then the integral of the Rabi frequency in time can turn out to be zero. So, How would you go about calculating um, this kind of multi-photon coupling? Um, I think I'm going to leave this uh, PDF file for a moment. How would you go and then calculate all of these terms? Basically, you can go to the NIST Atomic Physics Database, and you can look up the Einstein A coefficients. And from the Einstein A coefficients, you can get all the transition dipole moments. And um, if you know all the transition dipole moments, then you can calculate the contributions to the start shift from all of the off resonance states in the system. So let's consider the lithium atom. So let's say we want to go from the 2s to the 3s state in atomic lithium, and we want to do it with a two photon transition. Then we'd say, okay, well, we're going to be interested in the contribution to the multi photon coupling and the dynamic start shift from all of the p states in atomic lithium. And we can look up what all the atomic um, what all of the Einstein A coefficients are for those states. And those are given from the atomic NIST atomic database here. And then you can use that to calculate transition dipole moments. And you have all the detunings. So you can do the calculation. And basically, you can now calculate the effective multi photon coupling and the, trend, the dynamic start shifts. So basically, the diagonal and the off diagonal terms in this 2 by 2 of atomic physics Hamiltonian. So I think. So why did I bother going through this derivation? Um, the idea, I think, was to give you a flavor for how the, you can calculate a multi-photon transition um, uh, um, coupling and how you can calculate the shifts of the atomic levels in the, uh, in the strong field that's affecting that coupling. So now you have some sort of idea that it's all of these off-resonant states, if there were no off-resonant states, there would be no coupling. So while you might be able to reduce it to a simple 2 by 2 Hamiltonian, where you have ground state and excited state, and you say, oh, I can do a multi-photon absorption, that multi-photon absorption basically only exists courtesy of all of these off-resonant states. And those off-resonant states will allow you to couple this ground state to this excited state, but they'll do so at a price, which means that the energies of these states can shift during the coupling. And if you don't compensate for that, then you can basically end up with zero probability of going from the excited state to the ground state. And that dynamic start shift is also something that you can use 
to make um, an effective control in experiments. And so I'm going to give you a few examples now um, of how this dynamic start shifts come into play in strong field experiments. Um, and so I'll try and tie this into things that Lou Morrow has talked about in Phil Buxbaum. Um, and so, for instance, how do dark, dynamic start shifts come into play in strong field ionization? Well, um, in strong field ionization, you, um, what you're interested in doing is you're interested in taking an electron from a bound state and you're try, interested in putting it into the continuum. And energetically, that takes a simultaneous absorption of multiple photons from, let's say, some lower energy field. Lower energy, uh, or basically h bar omega, is much smaller than the ionization potential. And so as you turn up the strength of the field, then you're going to get a bunch of shifting of all of the bound state levels, and of course you have a shifting of the continuum, which Lou talked about as being bondermotive. So that means that the energy of a free electron is going to shift by this amount, where omega is the frequency of my laser field, I is the intensity. And as he pointed out, all of the high-lying states of the atom are going to shift close to bondermotively because those are nearly free electrons. So these guys here in these high-lying Rydberg states are going to shift in a way parallel to the continuum here, which is where all the free, like, where all of the free continuum states are shifting. And, and so what I was talking about is, how do all of the states way below the continuum shift? They all shift similarly quadratically with the electric field, so they shift proportional to the intensity, but the direction and the amount is something that's very different from the shift of these guys here. So, now I want to talk about, sort of switch over from talking about a derivation and, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and mathematics to start talking about some experiments. And so, um, what I want to talk about is a couple of experiments. One is by uh, um, the group of Albert Stolo at NRC, and there's another one is, the, uh, is more directly related to the Starship stuff um, of a former student of mine, Carlos Traero. And I want to talk about those experiments, but in order to talk about those experiments, I think it's probably a good idea to talk about how you make short pulses in the first place. Um, and, uh, and one thing that I think is sort of a recurring theme in many of the talks that you've heard is that in order to get short pulses, in order to get attersecond pulses, you need a nonlinear response of a medium. That is, all of sort of attosecond physics, all of femtosecond physics, all of ultrafast physics is born out of a nonlinear optics. And that's the way that we generate short pulses inside a titanium sapphire mode locked oscillator. So in the early days, this used to be called magic mode locking. And the idea was that normally when you think about a laser, you think about a single frequency inside of a cavity, and that single frequency um, is sort of what is really making the laser special, that it has a very, not only in addition to the statistics, but that you have a very well-defined frequency for your laser. Um, and in order to generate very short pulses in such a laser, you therefore have to now think about adding up lots and lots of longitudinal modes. And in order to do that, you also have to add them up with the right phase. And so if I just take um, multiple modes of my laser and I add them up with random phase, then I'll just get noise out of the laser. And so what we need to do from a laser like this in order to generate very short pulses is to add up on the order of a million modes, an order of a million longitudinal modes of the cavity, and we have to add them up with the right phase. And how does that work? Um, so the idea is that basically inside this ultrafast laser system we have a titanium cipher sapphire crystal which has an extremely broad gain bandwidth. And that's what allows you to generate lasing over many, many, many modes, the million modes that you need to sustain such a short pulse. And the way that you get mode locking inside of this crystal, um, or in the, other, the way that you have to generate the short pulse is to lock the phases of all of these modes. And in order to lock the phases of these modes, you need to um, have a gain in the crystal, which somehow is different from mode locked operation from CW operation. And the way this is affected is basically through Kerr lens mode locking. And the idea is actually kind of simple, and, and means that the index of refraction of this crystal um, is intensity dependent. And if it's intensity dependent, then you can get a small lensing effect based on the crystal if you have high intensity. 
And so if you have a small noise in the laser system, which means that you can have a very small um, region in time where you get an intensity which is larger than the CW intensity, then you can get a small lens here for a very short time. And that lens, for a very short time, can make the cavity stable. If imagine that you adjust one of these mirrors so that the cavity is slightly unstable. So that means that the, um, the gain minus the losses, with the cavity misadjusted, can be below the threshold for lasing. But now if I have imagined that for a very short time I have an additional lensing property inside this gain medium here, then um, I can imagine that for that very short time, I see a much higher gain minus the loss, and so I can generate, um, I can go over threshold for a very short amount of time. That means that I can have a gain minus loss for mode locked operation that's a little bit higher than the gain minus loss for CW operation, which means that I can now generate short pulses with a higher gain than I would have for CW operation. And so this is just a cartoon showing that if you have five modes that are locked in phase and you can get them adding up for a very short time, and then you get disruptive interference, which leads to no um, intensity as a function of time, and then again another short pulse. And if I have 25 modes, I can make it even shorter. And if you have a million modes, then you can make this so short that it's about a millionth of the time between the pulses, and that's the round trip time in the cavity, which is about 10 nanoseconds, so you can make a roughly 10 femtosecond pulse coming out of this laser system. If we amplify those laser pulses, we can generate um, fields that are very short, on the order of 3 times 10 to the 14, minus 14 seconds, and we can give them lots of energy, which means that we can have uh, control intensities that are much greater than the atomic field of the atomic unit of intensity is, as Lou was discussing earlier. The other thing that I, um, well, so the other, the other important technique that I'm going to cover is velocity map imaging. Um, but I'll cover it in the context of this experiment of the STOLO group at NRC, um, uh, which I wanted to talk to you about to say how you can use dynamic star shifts um, uh, for control to affect control. So Phil gave a really nice discussion of how um, you're interested in uh, controlling quantum systems and controlling molecules and going from an initial state to a final state. And in this particular experiment, the idea was to do, use dynamic start shifts to shift the, atom to shift the molecular levels during a chemical reaction in order to influence the outcome of the reaction. So the idea is that they wanted to do a sort of zero photon control experiment. That is, the control pulse would be not absorbed, there would be zero photons absorbed from the control pulse, and so it would be acting as a real laser catalysis. And the idea is that if I excite the molecule to an excited state here, labeled B, and there's a wave function which will now evolve because we're removed from the equilibrium position of the molecule. So it's a, the molecule is IBR, and the graph on the left here shows potential energy curves for the molecule as a function of the distance between the two atoms. And what you see here is that um, in the ground state, we're starting off from the equilibrium position, and when we excite with a pump laser, up to the position here on the excited state, then the wave function is going to evolve because the force acting on this wave function whoops, whoops, and is roughly equal to the gradient of this potential here. And so we're going to move away from this position here, and as the wave function evolves, it comes to a point where these two curves here undergo an avoided crossing. And this is again something else that you guys have heard about before here, and at this avoiding crossing here, there's a probability for the wave function to go up into this excited state here, or to remain on the adiabatic ground state here and exit in this channel here. And the idea was, if we can apply a laser, a strong field laser pulse, that can shift the energies of these two levels, then by moving this avoided crossing or by changing the gap between these two levels, we can change the probability for going and exiting in the excited state or coming out on the ground state. So, um, the, the, and the probability for going, for hopping between potentials or for maintaining or staying on the same potential is given here by the uh, lander zener probability. And here, let me just explain the terms in this equation here. So V23 is the coupling between potentials in the diabatic basis. In this adiabatic basis here, these are the adiabatic potential curves. 
That's uh, basically the gap between these two potentials right here. The, on the bottom here is V is just the velocity of the wave packet as it's moving on this ground state potential or this intermediate state potential. And V2 minus V3 here is simply the, uh, or the derivative here is just the difference in the slopes between the two potentials at the avoided crossing. So this probability, I always like to look at limits in a formula like this. And so if the wave function is moving very, very slow here, then this term, the denominator, can go to zero. And so then this probability for hopping um, is going to go um, to zero. And if the velocity is going very fast, then this probability is essentially going to go to one. Um, and we're going to be able to come out on this excited state here. So the idea is, if the dynamic start effect changes the location of this avoided crossing, <coughs> then we can change oops, how much velocity the wave function has as it approaches the, uh, the pro approaches the avoided crossing. And therefore, we can control the probability of exiting in this state or in this state here. Can you give us a, an idea of the order of magnitude of the time during which the, the molecule is in this avoided crossing region? Is it, is it picoseconds? Um, well, actually, we'll look for the data, and the data will say on the order of like a fraction of a picosecond, 100 femtoseconds, something like that. So you have to time your... It's a, it's a timing experiment. Right. So what, how does the, this is a great question. So now, how does the experiment go? So the idea is that we start off here, we pump the laser to this excited state here, now we're going to let the wave function evolve, and when it's in the vicinity of this avoided crossing here, we're going to come with a control pulse, which is going to manipulate the spacing and the position of this avoided crossing. Therefore, it's going to change the probability of going into this state of that. But now I still have neutral products, and I need to detect them somehow. And the detection is going to be through a technique of velocity map imaging, which I hope to outline and explain to you here. Because it's also come up a lot, and it's a very um, sort of well-worn technique in UltraFest. Um, uh, dynamics experiments. So the idea is that we're going to take these two neutral products. One of them leads to a spin orbit ex ex excited state here, and the other one leads to this ground state here. As you'll notice here, the potentials have different in energy. So you can imagine that the fragments are going to be traveling with different velocities as they exit out here. Right? So now let's consider the different velocities of these two fragments. If we can somehow measure the velocity of those fragments, then we can get information about which exit channel the molecule went on. And so the idea is that we can use a technique called velocity map imaging, something that images the velocity of these fragments to some detector. And so a lot of the times you might be familiar in Fourier optics with the fact that a lens can take a Fourier transform. And it can map k space onto position and position to k space. If you just think about parallel rays going into a lens, they all get mapped to the same position. It's because their k vectors were all the same coming in. And if you think about light coming from a single point, the light comes out, out of the lens if it's a focal length away, all parallel, because I'm mapping the position that the light originated from with the k vector on the other side of the lens. If we can make a lens for ions that act similarly, then we can take a similar Fourier transform of our dissociating molecule. And so imagine that we have conducted the experiment between a set of plates here upon which we can apply a voltage. We can make an Einzo lens, basically a lens for ions, that will allow us to map the velocities of these ions to a unique position on the detector. And the idea is very similar to imaging with optics. I'm going to essentially take a Fourier transform of my wave function in between these plates and put it onto a position sensitive detector. That means all ions which originated with the same velocity get mapped to the same position on my position sensitive detector, and therefore I can take a picture of the velocity space wave function of this dissociating molecule. And so that's exactly what they do. And so you can see that these electric field plates then are basically my ion optics or my imaging system, and I go to what's called a microchannel plate here. And that's basically just a two dimensional detector which multiplies those ions. So for each ion that hits here, I get about a million electrons on the other side. And if those electrons hit a phosphor screen, just like on your TV set, then you basically get some light emission. And the light emission is therefore proportional to the number of ions that hit at a given position. So if I take a picture of that phosphor screen with my camera, then I get a picture 
of what the velocity distribution of the fragments that were interacting with my laser pulse were. Therefore, if I have fragments that were traveling at different velocities here, I can measure how much of each fragment at the different velocities I'm, I'm, I'm generating. So here's basically an image, and I guess there's, it's not possible to see it in, in, in too much detail, but if you take a line out of this image, you can see that there are two rings. So this is basically just um, a radial line out of the image from the camera. And you can see that there's a peak here at low velocity, and there's a peak here at high velocity. And that simply corresponds to the two exit channels here. If you come out of the higher electronic state here, you're going to have lower velocity, and on the lower one, you're going to have higher velocity. And so now what they did in the experiment is they varied the time between this pump pulse and this control pulse. It's a three pulse experiment. Okay? It's a pump to here and evolve, and then there's a control pulse, and it's all followed by a pulse which simply ionizes because you can only map the velocities of ionic fragments and you can't do it for neutrals. So the ionization pulse is simply just ionizing these fragments. And so what the experiment did is they varied the, the timing between the pump and the control pulse and they watched how much was um, uh, in the excited state versus the ground state. And here's a calculation that took into account basically the dynamic star shift that I talked about earlier. So they're using a very far off resonant field here, which makes sure that the control pulse was not having any absorption and no emission. So that's how you can think about it, that the light was really acting like a catalyst. What does a catalyst do in a chemical reaction? It doesn't participate, so there's no... If you look at the net equation for the chemical reaction, the catalyst is not um, being increased or, 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 or reduced in the, in the net equation. And similarly, there's a net zero absorption of photons here from our control pulse. And yet, we can use the control pulse to influence the amount of molecules that go out on this exit channel versus this exit channel. That's why this paper was titled Dynamic Stark Catalysis. You're using the Stark shift to influence the outcome of a chemical reaction by just use, by manipulating the positions of the levels during the evolution of a quantum wave function through the system. So here's the experimental yield. And you can see that you can, depending on the timing, you can either increase the amount of um, exit on the ground state, or decrease it here. And you can see that both experiment and theory agree quite nicely, because this is a system for which it was possible to do the Stark shift calculation and the wave packet evolution in rather great detail. And so a closed loop approach was not necessarily required, as Phil was discussing earlier. Yeah? Why is there a hump in the end of the experimental result? Um, if I had done this experiment, I could probably tell you. Um, I'm not sure whether this is basically just, uh, yeah, I basically don't know. So, um, I think that the part of the differences um, between these two data sets are the finite pulse durations, and I don't know if those were included in detail in the theory calculations. But, um, but I think there's a, a reasonable agreement in terms of the amount of control that's available and the, the overall shape. Um, I mean, in a sense, the, Part of the reason that I went through that entire calculation of the dynamic Stark shift is to give a flavor for how you actually carry out the calculation that would involve how much do these levels shift. This is a cartoon that shows how those levels shift, but you can actually calculate it. And the question is, you would have to involve a large number of molecular states in order to get this calculation very accurate. I recently heard a talk about um, sort of more refined calculations on this exact experiment, and people were using 40, 50 states and didn't yet find convergence. Um, whereas for the atomic sodium calculations that I was talking about, we found convergence on the order of eight states and then things were down in one part in a thousand. So that is that once the detuning and the dipole moments fell off for the atomic transitions, we didn't need to include any more off-resonant intermediate states. But here there are many, many, many states and they make significant contributions and so it makes it much more difficult to do the calculation. But, um, but the same reasoning sort of holds through. So, okay, so let's talk about a second example. And this example um, is one that um, uh, we carried out in my lab. Uh, Carlos Ferrero was a student who, who, who did these experiments, and he did both the calculations and the measurements. And this is a maybe more simple, direct application of the calculation I outlined earlier. The idea is that 
Let's imagine that we want to go from this state here to this state in a two-photon absorption. Um, and we want to do it um, efficiently. Let's say we want to make a pi pulse, a multi-photon pi pulse. We want to invert the population. So it's a simple goal, and it fails for a simple reason. That is, as I crank up the field, the levels go out of resonance because they shift out of resonance, and I end up with essentially zero population transfer. And um, so if you ignore the star shift and you say, how does the population of the excited state go if I want to ignore the star shift? You can make a pi pulse, one that takes you from the ground state to the excited state, and the area of the pulse is pi. So the integral of the electric field multiplied by the transition dipole moment and divided by h bar is pi, or pi over 2, depending on how you define the Robbie frequency. And if I actually include the dynamic star shift, I go up and I come right back down. And the way to think about that in the time domain is that, well, you might think that what's happening is that I go out of resonance and I don't transfer anything, but you can also think about it that the dress states have a phase advance which is accelerated by the dynamic start shift, because the start shift pushes them off resonance, which means that their phase doesn't evolve at the natural um, atomic frequency between those two levels, but it evolves with an accelerated frequency. And I'll show you a movie that tries to capture that. So let me describe what this movie is going to show you. This is very simple. This is just the phase difference between the ground and the excited state as a function of time. And you'll see that this phaser is just going to rotate. So the atomic phase is just going to oscillate at the ground excited frequency difference. Then we're going to have our laser. And basically, just as this is just the phase advance of the laser. And the bottom here, I'm going to plot the intensity of the pulse. And here I'm going to populate, pop, uh, plot the excited state population. And um, I have to show that in this guy here because the new version of PowerPoint was used by this video. <laughs> um, but so let me see if I can make I guess we can see it like this, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is just what I was describing. Um, so now I'm going to play the video. And you see that the intensity is low, and these guys are evolving at exactly the same rate, because I've tuned my laser to be on resonance. But now you see that as the intensity of my pulse turns on, and as I start transferring population, this is good, the atomic phase has evolved more rapidly than the laser phase. And now, to our great dismay, we see that these two guys have gone more than pi out of phase, and when the laser and the atom get pi out of phase, well, what happens is you go from stimulated absorption, putting more atoms into the excited state, to stimulated emission. And so everything that you put up into the excited state simply gets driven right back down. And so in the end, you end up with essentially zero population transfer. This is basically a two-photon dark pulse. And um, that's sort of rather disappointing because none of your atoms ended up in the excited state, even though that's what you intended. Okay, so um, we actually decided to do the following. We decided to do what Phil outlined to you which was to do a closed-loop experiment to see if a genetic algorithm could figure its way out of this problem. And so this is the experimental setup. And we had a pulse shaper similar to what Phil outlined. And we um, did some imaging of the light in order to make sure that we had a relatively constant Rafi frequency. So if you just focus a laser beam into the um, atomic sodium vapor, then it's a Gaussian beam and has um, a varying Rabi frequency across the transverse profile. And so that would seriously mess up the experiment because all of the atoms would see different dynamic start shifts and you'd be averaging over an entire mess. And so we got around that by focusing our light onto a pinhole, which cut off the beam at the sides and imaging that pinhole into our interaction region. And then we simply looked at the fluorescence from on this transition here as a measurement of how many of the atoms got excited to this excited state here. And it turns out, actually, that in addition to um, making a population, in addition to putting lots of atoms up here and seeing spontaneous emission, 
It turns out that we also saw some stimulated emission. That is, we also saw lasing of the sodium atoms inside of our heat pipe oven. And in a sense, that was the best indication of anything that we really did get a population inversion. Because, of course, you know that you can't get any lasing without a population inversion. They're so, not based on the 11... I'm sorry? It's based on the 11 heavy nanometer? It did also there, but we didn't measure that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe in a little bit more detail how these two are related. And so what it lays on the 589? It lays on the 589. Yeah. Um, but we weren't driving any atoms initially with our short laser pulse into the 3P, so we knew that it must have had a, um, right. uh, a large number of atoms up here. So, um, and we'll get to it in a bit, that there's actually a kind of an interesting relationship between the populations here in order to get a population inversion on this transition. But you know that you have to take at least 50% of the atoms from down here up to here before you can get a population inversion on this transition. So this was kind of a funny thing. I was up in my office and Carlos called me from down the lab and said, you know, there's orange light coming out of the heat pipe oven in the forward direction. I was like, no, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's not happening. And of course, you know, I ran down to the lab and indeed there was orange light coming out of the heat pipe oven, which we didn't design the experiment to do. And it took us a while to understand what was going on, but essentially we were so efficient and so effective at driving the atoms up to the excited state that we created a population inversion. And then we had a cascade, and which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, down to the ground state, which allowed us to get basically a, a giant pulse or a super fluorescence out in the forward direction. Okay, so we pretended that we didn't understand what was going on here, and we just wanted to say, hey, how can a genetic algorithm figure out what's going on here and overcome this problem of the dynamic star shifting of the ground in the excited states? And so, um, we, uh, we, as Phil outlined, we um, uh, uh, made use of a closed loop learning control experiment, and he gave you a nice discussion of that in some detail, so I won't go through the details, other than to say, if we just plotted the amount of spontaneous emission as a function of time, as a function of generation, you can see that the learning algorithm figured out how to improve over an unshaped laser pulse for the drive, and we were able to improve things by a factor of three or four. And we also then said, well, why not just see if the learning algorithm can generate more light in the forward direction, i.e. more stimulated emission? And yeah, we were able to improve things by about a factor of three or four, but it's on a log scale. So that means that we got some gain here of a factor of three or four, and here about a thousand. So what's going on? And so we can measure the optimal pulses from this um, control experiment. So the learning <coughs> algorithm was there shaping the laser pulse, and the kinds of pulses that discovered were ones which were separated um, with, uh, were, were multi-pulse sequences, which were separated by characteristic times on the order of 200 femtoseconds. And so immediately our first thoughts were, well, this is a sodium atom. There's nothing about this atom that responds on a time scale like this. This is more of like a vibrational time scale. So this is an evolution of a vibrational wave function. There are just atoms in there. So what's going on? And so we, well, we just derived a Hamiltonian for this system, which involves multi-photon coupling and this atom field phase, which has built into it the dynamic start shift. So we said, let's just see if we integrate the Schrodinger equation with these solutions that we measured, does it give the right answer? And indeed, that's exactly what happened. So each of these three pulse shapes, which were done under different, slightly different central frequencies of our laser, yielded large, much larger populations than an unshaped laser pulse. So what this is showing is the dash dot line is how much population will be transferred for an unshaped laser pulse. And the dash line here shows the pulse, the optimal pulse that our genetic algorithm figured out. And the solid line shows how much population you transfer for the optimal pulse. And in all three cases, you can see that the optimal pulse greatly outperforms the unshaped laser pulse. And in many cases, can lead to a population inversion, population much greater than a half in the excited state. So what that's saying is that, oh, okay, the genetic algorithm really did figure out solutions that, um, that overcame the dynamic star shift problem, and which the Schrodinger equation agrees should work. But that still didn't satisfy our desire to have an intuitive picture for what's going on here. 
And so the idea was, um, can we analyze these understanding the dynamic start shift and see whether we understand what's happening in the atom? And it all comes back to this idea of the movie that I showed you. And that movie showed you that if the dynamic start shifts lead to a phase advance of the ground and the excited state relative to one another, then you go from stimulated absorption to stimulated emission. And essentially, this is the same idea as you have when you're doing nonlinear optics. If you're trying to make second harmonic generation, and if you're um, not phase matching, then what happens is that you start to generate light that's out of phase with light that you generated earlier on in the crystal. And so, in order to make that not happen, you do phase matching. So the phase velocities of the two components are traveling at the same, uh, are the same. And that means that the phase of the light that you're generating, the second harmonic or whatever you want, is always going to be in phase at all parts of the crystal. But sometimes you can't afford, you can't generate phase matching by designing the crystal appropriately. And so people sometimes resort to something called quasi-phase matching. That is, when the coupling is generating light that's at the right phase, keep generating more of it. But if the phase between the drive and the light that's being generated goes to pi pi, so you're generating stuff that's out of phase and which would destroy the amount of new light that you're generating, turn the coupling off. And this is called quasi-phase matching. This is exactly what our genetic algorithm has figured out. It generated multi-pulse sequences with the spacing between the two pulses, or three pulses in the train, such that the phase between the atom and the laser evolves by exactly 2 pi between those subpulses. So this graph here is showing that a double pulse sequence, and you see that there's some population transferred in the first pulse, and in the second pulse there's again a lot of population transfer. And if you look at the phase evolution between the atom and the laser, between those two pulses, it's exactly 2 pi. So the genetic algorithm realized, oh, <laughs> shut off the coupling when the coupling is pushing atoms down, and turn it back on when it's making the atoms go back up. And so this is basically exactly what we figured out. Well, it was the algorithm, and, um, and this is how we interpreted it. And, um, so did you find solutions where you had a full train of pulses, or does spontaneous emission kill you after a while? Oh, the, 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 the sequence of pulses was orders and orders of magnitude below the spontaneous emission lifetime. Okay. So we never were limited by that. I think we were more limited by the fact that it's easier to make two or three pulses then it is, it's much, you, you need more a rapid phase variation to make a larger train of pulses. Okay. Um, and so it was just sort of an easier solution in the phase space of the search. So you, you had that in your cost function? We, um, we actually did build it, we did experiments with both a cost function and not a cost function. And these were, I think, uh, obtained using a cost function. And the cost function he's referring to is that we tried to make sure that the solutions were as simple as possible so that we could interpret them. And we basically made the genetic algorithm pay a penalty for complexity of the pulse shape. And there are simple ways to implement that in the closed loop learning. So, um, so the last thing I think I'll just sort of mention here, in, uh, um, is, uh, is how we could use um, an understanding of basically solving both Maxwell's and Schrodinger's equation. Um, to understand how it is that we could get this stimulated emission and this, this lazing of the sodium atom. These are just the equations that describe, um, we tra transferred our equations to density matrix formalism, and um, then we modeled the interaction between the, atom and the, uh, the atoms and the laser um, in terms of basically solving the Schrodinger equation. And then we let the fields that could be emitted by the atoms propagate it. So we just solved Maxwell's equation. And so what we did is we went through our interaction region and we solved Schrodinger's equation at this position. Then we solved Maxwell's equations to get to the next position. Then Schrodinger, Maxwell, Schrodinger, Maxwell, Schrodinger, Maxwell, until we got to the end of the interaction region. And we had a field, which was given by these expressions down here, that was basically building up as the um, light was propagating through the sample of sodium atoms. And by doing that, um, well, this movie doesn't show up well here. So, uh, let's see if I can show it on the... Uh, 
Okay, so this is a movie which shows um, the solution to Schrodinger's and Maxwell's equations, and which is showing the. Um, let me see if I can pause it. So what's shown here um, in the x-axis is time in picoseconds, and on the y-axis is the intensity of the light at this orange light that we're trying to simulate or model. And what you see is basically here a red curve, which is an average over, um, over many calculations. And the blue curve is, an, is, a, is a single calculation where we see the emission from an initial spontaneous emission event. And what you can see is that as the pulse propagates through the medium, it builds up and um, generates a very large um, bright beam at the end of the atomic sample. And If we compare calculations to our measurements, then you see we get relatively good agreement for different atomic densities in, this, in, the, in the sample. And that tells us that our calculations are effectively modeling the interaction between the atoms and, um, and, and the emission of this bright light pulse that's coming out of the NVD type oven. And when we looked at the, how this depended on the amount of energy in the drive pulse, we noticed that there was a very sharp threshold both in the theory and in the experiment. And in the, um, in the experimental measurement, this is just the energy of the input pulse that's driving the population inversion in the atoms. And this is the integrated signal of this um, stimulated emission that we're getting out on the atomic transition. And this is the calculation which shows, well, depending on how much of the atoms we put up into the excited state, how much light do we get out at the end? And you see that there's a sharp threshold, and the dependence of these two curves is very similar. And what this is telling us is that, um, essentially, what's happening is that if you make a population inversion in the atoms, then you have all of these atomic dipoles which are sitting up in the excited state. And all these atomic dipoles can talk to each other. So by effectively compensating for the dynamic start shift, we can get all of the atoms into the excited state. And if you have a large density of atoms in the excited state, and they're all um, sitting like this, then when one of them starts to emit some radiation, the other guys can feel the emission of this radiation. And all of the atoms can emit one giant pulse, as if there were one giant atom. And you have a so-called superfluorescence. And what tells you is superfluorescence, and not something else, are many different measurements. But one of the key points, as you can see, is that the emission takes place in a time scale of about 10 picoseconds. And that's about a thousand times shorter than the spontaneous emission lifetime. So the atoms are emitting cooperatively in response to being driven coherently and being driven in an effective way where we've compensated for the dynamic star shift. So um, one last, so basically that sort of just gives you now two examples. So yeah. yeah. Sorry. So this, this is actually very interesting because uh, did you look at the at the fluctuations in the time at which your pulse is emitted? Because you must have wonderful quantum fluctuations there. So we, we didn't look at those fluctuations. There were a large number of fluctuations, but we averaged over many, okay. um, and, and that's why the calculations were averaging over many. Yeah. Um, we did see that there's no emission in the backward direction, and we did measurements as a function of, of the density of the atoms. And these are all consistent with this idea of the superfluorescence. No, I'm sure you start out fully excited, there is a, a random time virtually before the emission begins, and mm -hmm. then it goes back. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, so the, the calculations, in a sense, had this randomness built in, but when we averaged over many calculations, um, where we, we basically just seeded the calculations by putting, um, by, by, by slightly tweaking the density matrix elements to start things off. And then um, we averaged over many calculations to compare with the experiment. So, um, so what I've tried to outline is that, okay, there's this way that we can calculate how multi-photon coupling comes from. Where does it come from? It comes from all of these off-resonant states. And you pay a price for this multi-photon coupling, and that price is that you have a dynamic start shift. And you can think about this as a good thing or a bad thing. What I've tried to show you is two examples. One where it's good, where the whole point of the experiment was to make use of the dynamic start shift, 
to control how a chemical reaction unfolds. And the other was where it was hindering the ability to put the atom into the excited state, but we could overcome it using control. There's another experiment, which I will go over briefly, which was a closed-loop experiment <coughs> carried out in the group of Robert Levis, and we've done very many similar experiments, where the idea was to make use of dynamic start shifts as a way of manufacturing bandwidth. And I think this is a general idea that basically, for instance, in all of the um, experiments that, um, that Lou talked about earlier, the only way that you can get to shorter time scales than the pulse that you have and i.e. the only way that you can generate new bandwidth from, the pulse, from some, um, some original pulse that you have is to make use of a nonlinear interaction between a material response and your driving field. And this is essentially how all of attoseconds is formed. It's the nonlinear response of the atom or the molecule to the driving field. Which means that if you just, you know, the sort of dumb hand-waving way that I can motivate that is that if you just take a Gaussian pulse and you take it to the second power or to the third power, the width of that pulse keeps shrinking. And so if you just do that ad infinitum, you can get a very, very, very short response. And the reason that you can generate very, very short ad second pulses is essentially you're taking a very non-linear response of the ionization of a material, or an atom, or, or a molecule, to the applied laser field. And therefore you only get ionization in a very small window of time when the, peak is, when the field is near its peak. Similarly, if you want to drive control in a system where your laser field only has a finite amount of bandwidth and so you can't hit all kinds of resonances, you can use the dynamic start shift to start shift states into resonance. And when you're, as Lou was outlining, when your ponder mode of potential is on the order of your photon energy, what that means is that all the high-lying states in an atom or molecule will necessarily shift through resonance with your laser photon with some, let's say, M laser photons at some point during the pulse. So you're essentially manufacturing bandwidth by having a nonlinear response of your material to your driving field, and the dynamic star shift can allow you to generate resonances that you wouldn't have otherwise had. So here's an experiment which was done um, um, uh, on this large molecule acetophenone, and the idea was to see whether we could shape, well it was not done in my lab, this was done in the lab of Robert Lovis, to shape the laser pulse to make a new molecule where you break out the CO and form a bond between the CH3 and the ring. And so the idea was, well let's shine the laser pulses into the molecular beam here in an interaction region, generate molecular ions, and measure what fragments we make. And then use a genetic algorithm to optimize the amount of fragment production for a chosen fragment. And then, um, these were measured using time-of-flight mass spectroscopy. The idea is that if I accelerate these ions that I've made in the focus of my laser pulse through a given potential difference, they will each have a different um, um, velocity here that depends on their mass. Therefore, by measuring the time of arrival here, I can measure what their charge-to-mass ratio is. And so, therefore, I can measure a spectrum here of all of the different fragments that I make by interacting with the strong field and the molecule inside this interaction region. And so, here's a cartoon that, so basically what this shows is that they were able to generate this fragment here in a very exotic chemical reaction, where you take out the CO here and attach the CH3 to this ring here. So they're making and breaking bonds. And um, this is just showing you that this ratio of this fragment right here is increasing as a fraction of the total spectrum as they're optimizing it. And their basic argument for what's taking place in this experiment is that if you had weak field excitation, then here are the energy levels of the atom or the molecule. And if I start to now turn up the strength of my field, those energy levels shift in the dis you know, according to the discussion we just had, and they're shifting a lot if the intensity of the field is very high. Therefore, you can shift lots of resonances, or lots of states into resonance that otherwise wouldn't be in resonance, and therefore you can hit lots of states that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access. And by putting transferring population into all of these states, you're able to manipulate the wave function into the final state of this molecule, rather than um, into another pathway in the phase space of this uh, molecular hematoma. So, this is just another example 
of, um, of how dynamic start shifts can be effective in driving control um, and in uh, and, and sort of manufacturing bandwidth, which, which you can use to control. So um, I want to sort of stop by showing you two more slides. One just to sort of show you who are the people that participated in some of the experiments that I outlined, and Maya is sitting in the audience right here. And um, uh, she is a poster as well, which is on different material um, than what I've discussed today. But uh, I talked to you about Carlos Traero's work um, and a little bit about um, Brett Pearson's work. Uh, and these are other members of the group. We have strong collaboration with theory, which helps inform a lot of our experiments and, um, and allows us to interpret our measurements. Um, what I want to now do is what I had originally planned on talking about um, in the second lecture was strong field molecular ionization. Um, that is, basically, what I tried to show is, is talk about today was transitions between bound states, electronically bound states in an atom or molecule. And I wanted to go on to discuss strong field molecular ionization, ripping an electron out of a molecule, and what happens, you know, there are lots of electrons in a molecule, which one is being ionized as you turn on a strong field? But in thinking about this a little bit during my time here and listening to the lectures that Lou and Phil and others have given and Margaret, um, it occurred to me that maybe that topic is covered or topics that are close to it have been covered in some detail and it might be more interesting, especially to the audience here, to talk a little bit about quantum holography. Um, and whenever I ask for input or feedback or voting in my classes, I usually get very little response, and so I would like to allow you to make this choice, but you have to make a choice. Um, so I'd like to basically see what people are more interested in hearing about, and I'm more than happy to say a word or two more about what these are, because you know you should have an informed decision. Um, but I said a word or two about this. Quantum holography, the idea is we're interested in measuring, and what, what, what is quantum control about? Well, it's, in my view, I guess, has multiple goals. One is to generate exotic states of matter, to go to a particular target state from an initial state, and to learn a lot in how we can optimize going there. Um, and maybe that leads to the development of new spectroscopies, that is, new ways of getting information about the molecular Hamiltonian out, such as um, two-dimensional spectroscopies, or other ones where you're changing the pulse shape and not the frequency of a laser in order to generate the data set. Um, another aspect of control is to basically use it as a measurement tool for measuring wave functions. That is, you can try and generate a shape or an exotic wave function and then use ideas from your coherent control or quantum control toolbox to measure that wave function. And um, when you measure a wave function in quantum mechanics, you don't only want to know about the probability amplitude magnitude you want to know about the phase of that wave function. And so, as with many experiments, you can only infer the phase by measuring a probability for interference for two different wave functions. So quantum holography is the idea of using interference in an atom or a molecule to measure the wave function and to get not only the amplitude but the phase out. And I would talk about two principal examples, one in an atom and one in a molecule, to look at an electronic wave function and a vibrational wave function. Okay. So, time to vote. Um, although, so let's call this topic number one um, and topic number two. All those in favor of topic number two. All right, I've got my work to do. I'm actually prepared on this, and not on this. But all right. Um, <laughs>